Reading from the word of God, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's pray together. Our great and our glorious God, and our loving Heavenly Father, we come to thee, the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we worship thee and thee alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And our gracious Father, we thank thee for our blessed Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, O Lord, who came from heaven to earth to suffer and to die for needy sinners. And O Lord, we trust in his shed blood alone, shed blood alone for the forgiveness of our many sins. We thank thee for such a Savior who loved us and gave himself for us, and, O Lord, we pray that thou would so stir and so work in our hearts, O Lord, that we may seek after thee. We pray that our worship may be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, we pray that thou would help us to worship thee in spirit and in truth. And, O Lord, we pray for those who have not yet come to know the Saviour for themselves. O Lord, we pray for that mighty work of grace in hearts. Lord, draw out needy souls to thyself. Grant pardon and forgiveness and eternal life. Here are our petitions we ask, for we bring all these petitions in and through the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory. Amen. Let's sing our first hymn, hymn number 152. Hymn number 152. We give immortal praise to God the Father's love. Thank you. Turning now on the word of God to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. Psalm 138. 
I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou heard answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of my enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. May the Lord grant us a blessing from the reading of his word. Let's continue in the singing of our second hymn based on that psalm, hymn number 138. Hymn number 138. With all my powers of heart and tongue, I'll praise my maker in my song. Sorrows or 
from sins, the work of Savior undertakes eternal mercy never sins. I'm turning again in the Word of God to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, and reading from verse 11. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and reading verse 11. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in, Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which have devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. May the Lord grant a blessing on the reading of his word and give us all understanding of it. Let's pray together. Our great and our merciful Father, O Lord, we bow before thee, the creator of all, the God of all creation, O Lord, and we with the psalmist declare that the heavens and this world declare thy majesty and glory and power and wisdom, O Lord, it is so obvious that thou art the creator of all things, and our very consciences bear witness of this, O Lord, the invisible things of creation, thou art alone, art worthy of the highest praise and worship, and O Lord, we Survey this world, O oh Lord, and we see a world at war with thee. 
a creation at variance with their creator. Oh Lord, we are all in this state, even at birth, we stray far away from thee and we go our own way and we sin our, away our years. But we thank thee and praise thee, O oh Lord, for thy great redeeming plan of salvation to unworthy sinners. And O oh Lord, we, even as thy people, we thank thee that thou didst stop us in our tracks and thou didst work in our hearts and bring us to thyself. Lord, we remember that time when we had no interest in, in thee and we lived for ourselves, and we were so, so, so selfish, so indifferent to thee, but we thank thee, Lord, that thou didst trouble our hearts, and thou didst bring us to our knees to repent of our sin, and we thank thee for new life in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the forgiveness of all our sins. O oh Lord, we thank thee for our Savior, and we thank thee that throughout life we have his guiding hand and thy many promises, but, Lord, we come to entreat thee that thou would yet extend salvation and pardon and forgiveness to many more souls. O oh Lord, we rejoice in thy salvation. And, Lord, we thank thee that where sin abound, grace did much more abound. And so, Lord, we pray that even this day, as the gospel goes forth in this land, up and down this land and around the world, we pray for thy faithful servants who proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Sunday school teacher, every preacher, oh Lord, we pray for that mighty blessing from above, that the Spirit of God may trouble hearts, oh Lord, that many for the first time may hear the voice of the Saviour and respond, oh Lord, and they may know also the wonder of sins forgiven and everlasting life and new life in Jesus Christ. We pray even those among us this morning who have not yet come to know the Saviour for themselves, O oh Lord, who have been sitting under this gospel message for many years, yet unresponsive, Lord, we pray for them also. And even those who have come and have not heard these things as of yet, and those who are not familiar with these things, O oh Lord, we pray that thou will grant light and understanding, that we may truly know who Christ is and what he did on Calvary's cross, what he achieved for needy sinners. O oh Lord, grant that miracle of grace in our hearts, we beseech thee, that we may love thee. And, O oh Lord, we pray that thou would heal and cleanse us of our many sins. Lord, as we come to thy word now, speak to us, O oh Lord, and give us illumination and understanding in our minds and hearts. We bring these many petitions to thee, O oh Lord, believing that thou wilt hear and grant thy blessing. O oh Lord, rent the heavens and grant thy mighty manifestation of thy power to the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's sing our third hymn, hymn number one, 403, hymn number 403. O oh Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I of sin.
The stone to flesh do thou convert The trait of sinfulness remove O oh, speak into my wayward heart And melt in ten dying love this rebel heart, oh, now subdue and make it tender for me new. Oh, give me, Lord, the tender heart that trembles at the approach of sin. A godly fear of sin in part, implant and rooted deep within, that I may dread thy gracious power and live the of thee. I'm turning now on the Word of God to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 4, and reading verses 10 and 11. I beg your pardon, verses 11 and 12. Genesis chapter 4, reading verses 11 and 12. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And our subject for this message this morning is running from God. This is our condition as human beings before we come to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our default position according to what the scriptures teach. We are rebels. We are fugitives on the run from our creator. This is taught from cover to, go to cover in the scriptures. This was the condition of Cain. Um, God pronounced his judgment upon Cain for murdering his brother. And uh, we see the background of this. How did this come about? How, does, how did Cain end up in this wretched condition of being a, of a fugitive? Well, his parents, the parents of Abel and Cain, Adam and Eve, they fell into sin. They rebelled against God. And so did uh, Cain and Abel. They were sinners as well. Sin has entered into the world. And they, like their parents, they desperately needed to seek God's mercy and his forgiveness. This is the case with all of us. And Abel, the younger brother, he realized this. Abel understood that he was a sinner and he desperately needed God's forgiveness. And he followed God's instructions of when they were to come to the Lord and bring an offering that they need to bring a lamb, a sacrifice. This was God's instructions. Now, we're not told in the narrative of Genesis that this is what God instructed them to do, but it's obvious that he did. Because later on, this whole system of worship would be instituted under the leadership of Moses. So it was it's fairly obvious that this is what God had instructed um, Adam and Eve and his family to do. Bring an, a sacrifice, bring a, bring a lamb. And this is what Abel did. He, he felt deeply convicted for his sin and he understood why the lamb had to be, had to be brought. It was speaking of the great sacrifice that would come in the future. Abel understood this. He knew that by the shedding of the blood of this lamb that, that it couldn't take away his sin, but he understood what God was teaching him. And so did Adam and Eve, I'm sure, that through this sacrifice, it was symbolizing the great sacrifice, the one who would come in the future, the lamb of God who would take the sin, away the sins of the world. And so Abel, in obedience, brought the lamb, understood, under, understanding what it meant. And when he sacrificed that lamb, he was confessing his sins to the Lord. Abel, on the other hand, was completely different. 
He decided to ignore God's commandments. He decided to ignore God's instructions of how to worship him and how to seek him. And he did bring offerings to the Lord, but he brought the offerings of his own produce. He was a very skilled farmer and he was very good at what he did. And so he thought that with his fruit that he produced, his, his vegetables and so on from the earth, that if he brought these as an offering to God, that God would be impressed by this. But this, this wasn't God's instructions. God was calling them to repentance, to seek his forgiveness. And instead he brings his fruit and God rejects Cain and his offering. And Cain responds in a very negative way. He becomes fury, he becomes infuriated and he becomes very e envious and jealous of his brother. And so he ends up murdering his brother as a result. And now God pronounces a curse on Cain because of this terrible crime. Even before he decided to take his brother's life, God was warning him. We read it in the narrative. God was warning him, seek my mercy, seek my pardon. I will forgive you. But Cain ignored this and he went on to take his brother's life. And now God pronounces this judgment in verses 11 and 12. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened up the mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Sadly, Cain, you see, he was very fearful and troubled by this, but he was not actually sorry, sorry for the crime that he committed. You don't read that in these verses. He was sorrowful and he was petrified of what would result from his sin. He was fearful of the consequences, but not of the sin itself. How sad. And we see this in verses 13 through to 15. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from the face, from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So he was terrified of the consequences of this curse and this judgment that God placed upon upon him and what a tragedy it is but God says in effect because you have rejected my offer of pardon and forgiveness you will live your life as a fugitive on the run yes I will even protect you to a certain extent but nevertheless you will be a fugitive on the run and at the end of life you will be judged and this is how Cain lived he lived as a fugitive as a vagabond he reacted to his guilt in the in the worst possible way Instead of pleading for God's mercy, he ran away from God. And this is what we all do. This is what we all do. We run away from God. We run as far away as we can and live our lives apart from him. And so this is what we learn in, the, in, in this narrative. A godless life, a life lived away from God, is a life of growing debt, growing moral debt against our creator. We, we, we sin every day. And the, debt is, and the debt is growing. And our consciences bear witness that we need God's forgiveness. So verse 12, we're focusing on this verse chiefly this morning. When thou twillest, tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. And particularly that the latter half of the verse, the fugitive state of Cain, because this is our condition spiritually before we come to know the Lord for ourselves. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Fugitive in, in the original literally means wanderer, wandering, never settling, never feeling at rest, but perpetually wandering in the earth was, well, Cain um, attempted to uh, change his position. He built a city and so on, but he was always restless. And this is exactly how we what, what we go through in life as well. Spiritually speaking, we have many things in common with those who do commit crimes in society and live as, as fugitives. There are things we have in common spiritually from God's point of view. And I just list some of them. Well, it is, it is the testimony of those who have run from the law, who have um, committed crimes and who have been on the run. It is the testimony of these, of many, of, of so many fugitives that they live in fear. They live in constant fear of being caught. They're always looking over their shoulder. 
And they're especially in fear when there is a manhunt for their arrest, that the search is still going on. And even though they try to change their identity, change their lo location, change how the way they look, for fear that they will be, uh, if they don't do this, the, the police will catch up with them and they'll be dragged and hauled back into prison. Well, then as a result of this, they're living in constant insecurity because they don't know how long they'll have this freedom for, or so-called freedom. They're living, in, they're living in fear. They're constantly having, and they can't stay in a place for too long, many of these fugitives, because if they stay in the place for too long, they'll, they, the, the, they, the police might uh, find out where they are. So they're constantly having to move around and change their names. And it's been the testimony of some of these fugitives that they, the lives that they live are, are very, very solitary. They live solitary lives. They don't have the luxury of experiencing deep and meaningful relationships with other people because if, they, if other people start to get to know them too, too well, then they could blow their cover. So they, they live lonely lives, these fugitives. But it's the same problem with us. We, we can't know God on a deep and intimate level so long as we're rebels. And, we live, and, and, we, and many people, this is the testimony of, of the scriptures, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, this is the condemnation, this is why people will be judged by God, because they love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. I don't want to come to God. I don't want to. I don't want Him because uh, I love. I, I love my sin. I like my lifestyle just the way it is. And so people will never have the opportunity of experiences experiencing His loving kindness and forgiveness. But there's fear. This is the point I'm trying to make. Just like fugitives who run away from the law live in constant fear, are insecure, and are nervous, always looking over their shoulder. Uh, paranoid, well, we, um, this may not be something that I experience on the surface, but deep down, buried underneath all the distractions of life, there is this underlining fear that there is a day of judgment, that one day I'll, hand, I'll have to stand before my creator. It's deep down, it's not immediate, I'm, I don't have cold sweats at night, but nevertheless it's there. Underneath all the socializing, underneath all the distractions, I bury it, I bury it far underneath the, the deep recesses of my conscience, but it's there. And occasionally, on the rare occasion, it does come to the surface. I might, be, get, I might become seriously ill with something, or I attend a funeral, or there's a near-death experience. That could have been me in the driver's seat. I, I, I could have been the one that died. And what will happen if I die? And all of a sudden, I feel momentarily, I, I'm shaken by these things, and I'm deeply troubled. And I think, well, if there, if, if, if there is a God, I'm, I, I, I know that I'm, there's that fear, it comes to the surface. So to, from time to time, this does happen. But I quickly brush it aside, and it gets buried again with all these other things in life. And I try to forget, I try to forget it. But hey, friends, you, just, you only have to look around in this world, and you can see that this world is in chaos without God's favor. Yes, God does sustain this world to, an, to a certain extent, if God's common grace didn't exist in this world, we'll all be at each other's throats all the time. But because it's God's common grace, because he has his hand restraining the human race, but nevertheless, God does, to a certain extent, remove his blessing from the human race. So we do see what life is like without God. So much war and turmoil and hatred and unrest. And this should warn me, as someone who is living away from God, that things are not right. Things are not, I'm not supposed to create a utopia in this world because I can't, because this is a fallen world and this is a world under God's judgment. And so I need to seek him. He is, he is on a rescue operation, saving souls out of this world system. This is what, this is what I should be thinking. I cannot run, from, I cannot run away from my God forever. He will catch up with me. Despite all my efforts to run away from God, there is that divine, there is that appointment the appointment of death, which none of us can escape. I can strive to ignore this by the many things I do in life, uh, try to make my life as comfortable and secure as possible. I'll pay off my mortgage early. I'll have a secure job. I'll um, really look after my health, myself concerning my health and all these other things, trying to create this utop utopian state. And there is that inclination in people to do this. And there's nothing wrong 
in and of themselves of doing these things uh, a career. There's nothing wrong with these things. But if I'm someone who has not come to know the reconciling love of God, and if I'm a fugitive from the Lord, which we all are before we come to know him personally, then I will never be secure. You can do all these things, tick all the boxes, the things that you want to do in this life, um, and be financially secure and all these other things, but you will never have that security. You will always feel that un unrest and uneasiness concerning the future. That will always be the case. Why? Well, because there is life beyond the grave. There is heaven and hell. There is a God with whom we have to give an account to. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a village of people living at the foot of, of this huge mountain, this volcano, and this volcano has, has a reputation for erupting without warning. And this is what life is like. Life is unpredictable and death also is unpredictable. Death can catch us at any time. And so there is that underlining fear. Yes, granted, it's not at the surface most of the time, but it's, it's like a humming sound, it's deep down. And we're reminded of these things. The next thing that we learn about this fugitive condition is it's, a, it's a, a limited life. Fugitives live very limited lives. They're, they're very restricted. Um, I, I was reading up about this. There was this one particular man who was on the run for many years, for decades, from the authorities, but he found it very difficult because he was living almost in constant poverty. He was depending on handouts. He was depending upon friends and people who were willing to help him. And the reason why he had to, he had to do this is because he was he what he couldn't open a bank account he couldn't he couldn't even open a library account he couldn't do anything which would get his name on the system because as soon as his name was on the system well the authorities would soon recognize him and, ca and catch up with him and he was so restricted and eventually he couldn't cope and decades later he he handed himself in he couldn't he couldn't cope with it anymore all these restrictions it became so frustrating but again, it's the same with us. A life lived away from God, a life on the run is an incredibly restricted life, friends. Because God has made us not only physical people, not only are we flesh and blood, but we're spiritual. God has given me a soul. So there's this spiritual dimension to me and there's a physical dimension to me. But people live as if we we're just physical, we're just our animals. What a mistake that is to make. How spiritually frustrated you will be lifelong if you view life this way. I'm just flesh and blood. I'm just a higher animal. And I could just live up for the things of here of time. Friends, you will be so spiritually frustrated because you do have a soul. And the one who created you with a soul, he is missing from my life. So there's, there's, this, gape, there's this huge gaping hole within me spiritually. And I'm trying to fill it with all kinds of things because there is that longing and craving to reach beyond the physical. It's in every human being. And this is why people go in for so much entertainment um, and game playing and all these things. Why do people do these things? And increasingly so. Well, because they feel so restricted. I feel so restricted. If, and if that wasn't the case, there would be no, for, for many people, there would be no need for Hollywood. Hollywood coughing up more movies all the time. There would be no need for these things being um, improved all the time. Better graphics with games, these headsets. I'm now in this virtual work world. So many people have these many escape routes in life. Escapism is, is something that many people are, well, many people are living like this nowadays. Um, living a life, living a digital life, barely living in the physical world. And all, the, all this is happening because I'm spiritually frustrated. God has given me a soul. I'm not just a higher animal. I've been made to commune with my God. I've been made to love him and to receive his love and to know his blessing and his guidance. That's why I was created. So many people feel caged in in life. And I can't put my finger on it. Why do I feel this way? Well, it's because I'm a fugitive and I'm on the run from my God. And spiritually, my life is missing so much. How much we miss. How much you miss if you don't have a personal walk with the Savior. How much you're missing, friend. The great wonders and the mysteries of life are opened up to you when you come to know God in a personal way. He reveals so much about life. 
your life, what's that, what will happen in the future, the great mysteries of life are opened up to me, the great discoveries of the Christian life, how he answers your prayer in wonderful ways, how he blesses you, how he gives you such strength over your appetites, over your sin, the blessings of knowing his, his help in life, the many discoveries, the plans he has for you. We, please don't be mistaken, we're not just speaking about these things as Christians. We're not just speaking about these things from a doctrinal and f f philosophical point of view, but we speak about these things from experience. Because you see, the Christian is unique in this way. The Christian has, had, has lived up until this point two lives. I've lived a life without Christ, and now I live a life with Christ, so I can make comparisons. The worldling, the person who is not Christ, cannot do this. They've only ever lived one life. But now that I'm a Christian, I've lived a life without Christ, and now I've lived a life with Christ. And I can, there's such a massive difference, friends. The comparison is so, is so is the, the, the contrast is so great. And one of the great features of the new life in Christ is this, freedom, freedom. It's, it's so difficult to explain, but the liberty and the freedom, the emancipation of mind as Christ comes in and he opens up spiritual, spiritual truth, I understand spiritual reality as the Lord Jesus Christ said himself. And this is the experience of all those who come to Christ. If the son sets you free, then shall you be free indeed. And that is a testimony of all those who come to the Lord Jesus Christ, who seek personal faith. But then there's another problem that fugitives go through. I'm speaking about fugitives who are running from the law, but this is the case spiritually also. And that is guilt. So many of these people who commit these crimes, whether it be murder or so on, they experience guilt. From, and it doesn't go away. It, it, in fact, gets worse. And I have one particular incident in mind. This young lady, she... Um, she's in jail at the moment, but she, she committed murder. She murdered this young man when she was very young, and no one knew about it. No one found out about it, and she tried to live life. She tried to just get on with her life and pursue her career. But this event and the crime she committed, it haunted her, and it wouldn't go away. And she would, as she, as she said to the authorities, as she said in the court, that these things, this, this event of killing that young man, it, it was relived in her mind constantly until she started getting suicidal thoughts. She couldn't cope with it. And eventually, after 15 years, she had to hand herself to the police. She was so, she was so the, the guilt got the best of her. But this is, a, this is a feature that dominates the life without Christ. Guilt. It's a, it's a feature that dominates uh, 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 people who are run from the law, who do commit serious crimes such as murder and rape and so on, they have to live with the guilt for the rest of their lives, and some are more troubled than others. But this is the life of those who do not know Christ, who are lifelong fugitives on the run from God. It's a life with a guilty conscience strapped right, right next to you all the time. This is what, well, you may not be, you may not feel as traumatized as that woman did. She felt so traumatized and so overwhelmed with guilt. It may not be that um, painful, but nevertheless, again, it's, un, it's underneath the surface. It's there. That guilt is there. That unrest. You see, God created us for a purpose, for a distinct purpose, so that he may be glorified in creating us and that we may appreciate him and love him forever but we callously disregard him and we live as if we don't exist we have no interest in him whatsoever and also we're guilty of ingratitude we're guilty of violent gratitude we don't thank him for how he's made us how he's blessed us we we're so ungrateful and god will not let us get away with this yes there is a day of judgment coming but even in this life god will not let us get away with such an attitude he will manifest his disapproval by troubling my conscience. And there is many, many ways in which he does this. There are so, there's a variety of ways in which God troubles the conscience of those who are on the run from him. There's so many ways in which he does this. From time to time in life, as a result of being living a life away from God, I will go through periods where I feel this dysphoria. I feel so uneasy. I feel so disappointed. And many things. 
things outwardly may be going well for you. All may be going well. You might be in the perfect relationship. Uh, and other things in your life may go, but, but yet you feel this dysphoria. Why am I feeling this way? And this guilt often manifests, it comes to the surface. It's like a stain. And the thing is, you cannot remove the stain. Try to remove it. I challenge you, try to remove the stain by the many things that you have, go, the many distractions in life, the many things that this world offers. Try to remove the stain. You can't remove the stain. The only way the stain can be removed, the stain of guilt, is through the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. And I come to him, and he applies that blood to my conscience, my guilty conscience, and the guilt is washed away. But any other attempt to get rid of the, the, the guilt is vain. Doesn't matter what I do. I'll always have that sense of uneasiness and that sense of futility about life from time to time. Life is meaningless. I'm heading towards the grave. What do I have to look forward to? And it only gets, and people go to desperate measure, measures to try, to try to get rid of this guilt, but it's all done in vain. Look what, Lord, look what the Lord says to Cain when he first addresses Cain concerning the murder of his brother. The Lord questions him, Cain, where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? He was so, he was so um, callous and indifferent to the fact that he had murdered his brother. But look, look what the Lord says. The Lord said to him, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I hear your brother's blood crying to me. What have you done, Cain? The voice of your brother's blood crieth from the ground. And I can imagine that Cain, on occasion, the voice of his brother's blood throughout his life was crying in his conscience. Look what you've done. And he lived as a vagabond and a fugitive for the rest of his days. But again, it's the same with us. Our conscience, not all the time, but from time to time, it warns us, I'm in great trouble with my creator. I'm in trouble with the Lord. I'm in trouble with God. I desperately need his pardon. Well, when God starts to work in my heart, I feel that way. My, si my sins um, set the alarm of conscience to ring. My, my conscience starts to be troubled more often. And God reminds me that there is a day of judgment. I need, I need his forgive forgiveness. So the lessons we learn in this narrative is don't be like Cain. Please, friend, don't be like Cain. Don't continue to run away from God. And ignore the fact that there is a day of account. There is a day of judgment. He extends his hand of mercy to you. Will you refuse it? Don't reject his mercy. Don't continue to live life as a, as a fugitive. Because God's judgment will catch up with us. But instead realize that in God's warning, there is his infinite kindness. He warns us because he wants to save us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to bless us. God speaks to us through the gospel. You don't have to suffer like this. You don't have to live a life like this. You don't have to be judged. Don't be so stubborn. It doesn't have to be this way. I'm ready to forgive you. I'm ready to bless you. I've provided a way of salvation. Again, Abel understood this as he sacrificed the lamb. It was representing Christ, the Messiah, who would come many thousands of years in the future. He understood this. And this is God's redemptive plan, his plan of redemption. That in a point in history, he would come into the world as a human being. The Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, the glorious Godhead. And God the Father commissioned Christ to come in that period of time in history to perform the greatest conceivable act uh, of reconciliation as he offered his own life on that cross. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and hung on that cross. And the reason why he did so, friends, the Bible teaches it from cover to cover, because he would be the one who would take the punishment I deserve. He would suffer in hell and, instead of me. God would be willing. You see, can't, the Christianity and the Bible is different from any other man-made religion. Any, all the other religions would say, God is a God of forgiveness, and as long as you try to be a good person and live a good life and ask for his forgiveness, You'll be fine. No, you won't be fine. Because God is not, cannot just turn a blind eye to our sin. Our sin has to be dealt with. Who? What kind of judge? And sometimes we look at, look at what happens in the law courts and we cringe. Some criminals are let off so lightly for terrible crimes that they've done. Imagine someone rapes a little 
a little child and murders her. And then the judge says, and then the, and then the person in the court is weeping, bawling his eyes out. I'm sorry for what I've done. And the judge says, oh, I feel sorry for you. I'll forgive you. Wouldn't that be terrible? That he, the fact that he ignores what that person, that, that the judge ignores what that person has done. So God cannot ignore our sin. It has to be judged. It has to be punished. And so God had to deal with the problem. If anyone was to be forgiven, God would have to deal with the problem himself. I will take the judgment. I will deal with this debt myself because we are incapable of reaching God in our own strength. We're too sinful. So when Jesus Christ was dying on that cross 2,000 years ago, he was paying the debt of all those sinners who have come to him for forgiveness. And he extends that forgiveness to you today. What must I do to be saved? Believe that Jesus Christ personally suffered and died for your sins on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. You believe it with all your heart. You trust that he died for you. And if you believe it and you ask, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Lord, give me a new heart. Save me. Lord, put me on that pathway to heaven. Use your own words, but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Trust in him. And he promises to forgive you, to save you, to bless, to bless you. Please, friends, take these things seriously. Don't be a, a rebel. Don't be a fugitive. Any, we were all in this. We were all in this position. But when I do come to Christ and I'm made his child, gone is the guilt. The guilt is gone. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If I am Christ, if I belong to him, no more condemnation, no more guilt. It's gone. He paid the debt for me. Gone is my fugitive status. I'm now God's child. I'm no longer alienated from him. I'm brought into his kingdom. And I'm, I'm a forgiven man. I'm a, I'm a forgiven one, a woman. And he will, I will know that I'm a true, I'm, I will know that I'm a child of God. God will give me that assur assurance. He will bring into my soul such light and understanding and that peace that I know that I'm his, that love, that loving kindness, that reconciling love. Gone is the fear of death. I no longer fear death. I'm no longer troubled about these things because I know that death is a gateway where I will see my savior, the one who loved me and gave himself, on, gave, gave himself up for me. Gone is the restricted life. So restrictive is life without Christ. Gone is the restriction. I now know the liberty of Christ in my life, the abundant life, which he promises to all who come to him. Amen. Let's sing our last hymn, hymn number 432. Hymn number 432. I hear the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest.
was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in the light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. Our dear gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank thee that this is indeed a day of salvation, and thou art the God who extends the salvation to us. Oh Lord, how we thank thee for these rivers of blessing. O oh Lord, forbid it that we should be so foolish to ignore these things. Lord, work in our hearts that we may come to Christ and know that abundant life and thy mighty forgiving love. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.